to our next speaker, Josh Mollison from Sustainability House. Um, Josh, over the past two years, has been doing a lot of work around building air infiltra infiltration and thermodynamics. In conjunction, in conjunction with the Air Infiltration and Ventilation Association of Australia, he is also part of the driving force behind the air infiltration proposal for change to the National Construction Code or the Building Code. Josh is going to tell us a bit about leaky buildings, how to test them, and how we measure up here in Australia. So it's a perfect follow-on from your talk. Thanks, Josh. So following on from what Jess was talking about, yes, I'm going to talk a bit about blower door testing, uh, what it is, how you do it, a bit about air leakage and how a house leaks, um, how it's measured, uh, Australia and where we currently stand, so in relation to um, our performance of buildings and international benchmarks. We'll talk a bit about the net benefits and by doing so we'll use some case studies both new and existing and then um, talk a bit about industry change. So there's a bit happening. It's a pretty raw topic in Australia at the moment, but um, a lot happening and moving in towards um, getting it implemented in the wider range. So what is blower door testing? Um, some of you may have heard of it, some of you may not. Essentially, it's measuring the air tightness or the air permeability of the building envelope. Uh, by, we do this with a blower door fan. Um, so the fan controls the pressure levels within the home, and by doing so, we can escalate points of leakage. And uh, this allows us to see where, obviously, where a building leaks, but also how it exchanges heat energy with its environment. So where does a house leak? So there's three types of pressure that affect air leakage. You've got wind pressure, stack pressure, and mechanical pressure. Uh, I've got a little cross section here of a typical cottage. Um, as you can see, most of the leakage is actually coming from the top and the bottom of the building. Um, so they're the, the primary areas, both for new and existing housing, that you want to start sealing up to control that in particular the effects of stack pressure. So we talked about how to test it and where it leaks. So how do we find these leaks? So we've got visual and touch. So the fan will escalate points of leakage. So you can literally walk around and feel it. We've done a lot of work with builders um, in Melbourne and South Australia. And it's quite, ex it's quite hilarious to watch them run around their houses and find it really exciting to find where it's leaking. They're like school kids. It's great. Um, smoke pens. So this is a smoke bomb, actually, not a pen. but the fans on and you can see air being drawn up through an exhaust fan. And the main one, which is a really good tool to um, work hand in hand with blower door testing is thermal imaging. So I'm going to go through some images. If you want to jump to the next slide. Um, so for those that haven't seen thermal imaging before, it conveys uh, surface temperature. This is conveyed in color variation. So the colder the surface, the darker the color, the warmer the surface, the orangier, or reddier the color, if they're even words and a digital image on the left of a down, sorry, on the right of a down light. And can anyone tell me what the thermal image is picking up? The electric can remove the insulation. Correct. Um, very typical, and I hope there's no sparkies in the room, sorry in advance, um, but very typical of what we're finding, and it's just an education thing more than anything. We're still building to the old halogen days where you've got to pull the bats away, and we um, now have better technology where you can insulate up to it, or if not, over. So that leads on to second fix areas are generally a pretty big issue within um, our Australian construction industry at the moment. So we've got a return duct and the exact same concept. Uh, bats are moved. More often than not, they're actually up there. They've just been moved and not put back. And so here we've got a correct versus incorrect installation. So this is actually the same downlight. It's an IC rated downlight, meaning you can lay insulation straight over the top. Here we've got a bat missing completely, then that's quite a large area as you can see. And here we've got a consistent blur. Blur is fantastic, so we've got a consistent temperature image where the bat has actually been laid over the top. Um, so without thermal imaging, obviously most homeowners, uh, I don't know if many homeowners go in their roof, but you wouldn't actually be aware of what's happening in there and what's missing or not missing. So following on from Andrew's talk with um, thermal bridging as well. So the image on the left here, you can see a bunch of cold dark lines. That's the structural members of the roof and the walls. Um, so that obviously provides the least path of resistance. So you lose a lot of heat through that wall. Um, so how do we avoid that? Correct construction, so use of thermal brakes, etc. Uh, but also if there's alternative constructions, so um, continuous insulation, so things like structurally insulated panels, um, other polystyrene products as well. The image on the right hand side is of a structurally insulated panel and as you can see there's no structural members so there's no bridging. Um, so you get a consistent layer of insulation which is also provides a consistent air barrier. 
Other examples of air leakage. So um, the image on the left, we've got a bayonet fitting and you can see we've got what looks like water spraying out all around it. Um, pretty typical, we drill a hole this big in the ceiling and we poke a cable that big through it. And you add that by 50 and you've got a hole this big in the house. Um, exhaust fans again, um, so leakage through them. The current code doesn't require us to seal them to non-habitable areas, so it provides a pretty large ventilation area in bathrooms, en suites, that sort of thing. Um, bottom plates, so here we've got leakage from the architrave. As I said, most of the leakage comes from the bottom of the building, so this is really important to seal up. Uh, so we've got these cold, dark splatter lines coming in, and that's air actually being drawn into the building. Um, same picture down here is the top of a window architrave, so we've got air being drawn in across the top. You'll notice the vertical architrave, there's no air leakage because we cork them because we can see them, but we can't see the horizontal architraves, so trades haven't been educated to cork them. Um, and it's to, again, it comes back to, a, to an education thing. This, this image is um, really interesting. These are two of my favourite images I've actually taken, um, and they're probably not your typical of what you would find. The top image is a return duct on, obviously heating, and you can see you've got the heat um, coming out and congregating around this area across the top of the window architrave. Uh, we actually inspected the top of the architrave and it's corked all the way along to here, but the, it obviously couldn't reach the middle and it stops and it's corked all the way across to there. So the return duct's actually being, air travels from warm to cool, is being attracted to that section. So they're losing efficiency of their system straight away just due to the position of the duct, but also inefficient corking. Um, the last one is, you're looking at a ceiling. At the time of the photo, the roof space is warmer than inside. So this little red patch, M1, it's actually missing insulation. So the cold sections, I couldn't explain straight away. So upon further inspection, we actually noticed a little bit of moisture uh, build up and damage along the plasterboard and there was a roof leak. So there's roof, uh, sorry, there's water sitting on this, the ceiling lining throughout the whole roof space. Um, now the builder was actually about to hand this over to the client. Um, so he, luckily they could get to it first before further damage was done and it would have been a very expensive and um, unfortunate exercise that probably would have re resulted in a poor Google review and by someone and that sort of thing. So that for me was a really powerful tool that um, builders and architects can use at post inspection. Um, the last image is a positive image. I'll probably be negative so far, so we'll be a bit positive. Uh, we've got here we've got a north facing bedroom and we've got passive heat gain at its finest. We've got sun coming in and warming up the slab slash carpet. Um, so you can see see the temperature variation uh, both in colour and Celsius there. On to the next. So we talked about where it leaks, how it leaks, how we find it, how do we measure it. Um, so there's a bunch of international standards, I won't bore you with a whole bunch of acronyms, but the two main ones are ATMA and ISO that we use in Australia currently. Um, and there's a form of metrics that we measure. So uh, Andrew was talking about air changes per hour at 50 pascals. I'll focus on that one as it's probably the most internationally recognised metric for residential housing. Um, so what that means is the number of air changes per hour at 50 pascals. So the, the number of times the air is changing within the envelope at 50 pascals. Uh, 50 pascals is about the equivalent of a 30, 35 kilometre wind. Don't hold me to those exact figures, but in that ballpark. Um, so we tend to, oh, sorry, before I jump forward, the lower the number, the better, within reason for a naturally ventilated building. So for the South Australian climate, we tend to advise five to seven air changes per hour at 50 pascals. Now this is for a naturally ventilated building, so not with the heat recovery systems that Andrew was talking about. Um, with that in mind, you still get enough uh, air infiltration to uh, maintain good air quality, etc but you're also maintaining, uh, con helping to assist in maintaining constant temperature. So we've said the optimum is five to seven. This graph here, there's a lot going on, so I'll try and explain it in a reasonable manner. Um, the blue columns are all the test results we've obtained for South Australia for new housing. Um, you can see our average sits at just under 10, which is our blue line here, so the average of all those blue columns. 
The CSRO did a study late last year, November I think it was, where they tested 131 houses Australia-wide and they came out with an average of 15.4. Um, South Australia was one of the better performers of that, which is a good thing. Um, and here you can see our international counterparts are sitting their best practice and normal practice is all sub-10 air changes. So we're building to 15.4, so we've got a bit of a way to go to um, come to an a, a optimal level for the climate to maintain energy efficiency and thermal comfort, uh, but we're, we're working on that. So as we jump to the next slide, remember that 15.4 that I was just talking about. So currently in Australia, when we talk about energy efficiency for residential houses, it's at the design phase. So you would have heard terms like six star. So at planning permit, every house has to get a, a star rating or an energy assessment. So the, the minimum is six star. Uh, part of the software that you use to model that is called Nathers. Um, now that, for the South Australian weather file, a typical project home, the software models an air change rate of 6.04 air changes at 50 pascals. So we're designing at six air changes, but we're building to 15.4. So that raises the question, do we have a performance gap? Or we're not building what we're designing. So this graph here on the left, we've got six, uh, six star at six air changes an hour. And if we actually modeled that same house at 15.4 air changes, we drop 0.9 of a star. So we're designing six, we're building 5.1. <coughs> Um, so what does that mean? Obviously, as you can see in the red, there's a, a higher HVAC usage associated with that building. So we've got further demand on the grid than we're designing to, uh, further demand on peak load, um, and we're not hitting, and it's not helping to assist our carbon reduction targets. All right, so benefits of building ceilings. So benefits of building a, a building type. Uh, energy efficiency, which we've just talked about, so HVAC, reducing HVAC reliance and consumption. Indoor environmental quality, so the quality of air and of the space that we live in. Thermal comfort, uh, which is a really big thing, so in particular, I mean, it's quite cold in here right now. Um, I don't want to predict the air change rate of this zone here. But. Um, so I'm going to use some case studies to explain that. So it's all well and good to talk about reducing HVAC, reducing, uh, sorry, improving indoor environmental quality, but we'll use some case studies to explain that. So if we jump to the next one, this is uh, the house that we were just talking about before, open up to Sustainable House Day. Um, architecturally designed house by Suho Studio and was built to 3.7 air changes per hour. Now that's probably a little bit tighter than what we would normally advise. The occupant of the house has some systems in place to um, assist with ventilation and he's also a very active occupant, so opening windows and things like that. What we can see though is, um, We've got the HVAC usage of this house at annually under $400. Now, if we took that exact same house um, and change the air infiltration rate to what we're currently building to, we jump up to $560. Um, now, that doesn't sound like a lot of money, but it's, it's just construction methods. There's not a great deal of additional cost in what we're talking about in terms of building. So thermal comfort being the next one. Um, so here we have a graph outlining the total number of hours spent at each temperature throughout a year for a kitchen living area of a, another home. So the red columns are the kitchen living area at five air changes per hour and the blue columns are that same area at 15 air changes per hour. And obviously you can see we've got a, a massive amount of additional hours spent between what I say is comfortable um, is 18 to 24 degrees. So that's actually an additional 80 days in comfort with no aircon or heating assistance just due to the build quality of building ceiling of that zone. Um, so that's pretty powerful, I, I think. So same again on the thermal comfort, this same kitchen living area. So if we talk about annual comfort, what about peak comfort? So it's pretty cold at the moment, so a typical week in winter. So here we've got the outdoor temperature in green, trickling along at five, almost getting up to 10 degrees and uh, we've got the kitchen living area uh, at five air changes in red and we're sitting at five, uh, sorry, 15 getting up to above 20, but that same living area in a leakier built in the leakier zone, we're constantly sitting at three to four degrees colder. Uh, and again, this is without heating and cooling assistance. So the building as itself. Um, so we're using less energy, we're more comfortable um, and we'll jump to the next one. So that was for new housing, existing housing. 
um, we've got a pretty large portion of existing housing stock Australia-wide. Um, and they're a big draw from, for the grid and a big issue with peak load. So we're going to a typical example of a 1968 brick cavity place in South Australia, thousands of them about the place. Um, the client engaged us to reduce their running costs and uh, improve the thermal comfort of the home. One of those aspects was building ceilings, so we went in and did a, a blower door test. The original rating was 33.6 air changes. Now that sounds high, that's a pretty good representation of existing housing stock in Australia at the moment. Um, so the primary points of leakage were cracking and movement. We all know Adelaide Plains continually move, so timber strip footings love to crack. I live in one and it cracks. I've just painted and it's already cracked. So um, Leakage from windows and doors, suspended timber floor, so leakage from the bottom, and wall and ceiling vents. So the house had nine internal wall vents but no fuel source heating. So there's actually no requirement for those vents. We just got into the habit of putting them in because it was fun, I guess. Um, so what did we advise the client? Um, now, we, being an existing house and the, neither of the clients were typically handy with tools, so um, we tried to keep simple and non-intrusive and low cost. So windows and door seals, um, to nip down to Bunnings and grab some of them. Some wall vent covers, so this is a little picture of it actually over here, just a wall vent cover that goes straight over the top to cover them up. Um, some caulking at the corner seams, expanding foam at the skirting boards because there was quite large gaps. Uh, between the, the wall and the floor, and just a little bit of minor crack repair. Uh, total capital outlay on product for them was $270. Um, now keep that number in mind, and we'll jump to the next slide. The, um, so we came back and did another test, and we're down to 13.7 air changes. Now that's a 60% improvement from those improvements that they did to the house. And that's also lower than what we're currently building to on average for new housing. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Um, so here we've got the HVAC usage for that house. So we're sitting up at around $1,100 before, pre, before ceiling, current Australian average, post ceiling. So we've got a reduction of $277 in heating and cooling costs just from what they've done. Now again, that doesn't sound like much, but remember, it only costs $270. So that's a return on investment of 12 months. Um, and that's pretty good, uh, in particular when you look at return of investments of solar and, and things like that. So as a result, we had a tighter envelope, um, the occupants were more comfortable, less dependent on heating and cooling, and the next two are uh, something that I took out of it a lot and um, I think quite more powerful than the $277 saving. The owners reported a lot of spiders. Um, now I'm not talking like a scary movie, thousands of spiders running in, but constant spiders in the corners um, coming in through under the doors, etc. So a little fun fact, um, for those that live in a cold place like I do, um, spiders only spin a web where there's air movement. So if you go home tonight and you've got a spider web up in the corner or in front of your window, there's a leak. Um, so that would, that, so there's your first point of call, try and, try and fix that. So after they sealed up, they reported less spiders. Unfortunately, they didn't say no, they said less, but I'll take that. Um, and the last thing is improved health. So the wife of the couple uh, had asthma and also some skin irritations. She was very susceptible to changing conditions, etc. So as part of sealing up the building, um, we controlled how much the building leaks. And when a building leaks due to stack effect, you take um, water vapour with it. And when water vapour drapes out of the building, you get a drop in humidity. So if we drop the general guide is a drop below 30% in humidity, you get a change in comfort. So people that are susceptible to asthma, um, skin irritations, things like that, will feel uncomfortable. Um, and the positive out of that is the occupant has reported that they do feel more comfortable, uh, less, less irritations, that sort of thing. So for me, $270 saving is fantastic, but that you can't put a value on in, in, my, in terms of living in your home. Um, so finally, the industry change, so um, we mentioned before there's an Air Infiltration Ventilation Association of Australia, a uh, bit of a tongue twister. Uh, apparently it's actually been around for quite a while but it's just become under a bit of a rebirth, we'll call it. Um, and part that uh, association along with other industry bodies is driving some industry change. There's a current proposal for change to have this put in the construction code. So uh, every new house or every commercial building would have to be tested. 
Wouldn't that be great? Um, and that's due to come in, the next code changes for 2019, so we're working with other industry bodies on having that come in at a reasonable level that it will be accepted by the industry, but also have net gain. Um, and mandatory disclosure, so that's been around for a little while, Canberra has it, so at the point of sale you have to um, disclose your energy usage for the building. Um, it's actually having an effect on house values, uh, I think it was about 4%, I think, for the highest star rated buildings in that in that area, so they're talking about trialing it in Victoria and generally we tend to follow Victoria as they do things, so something to keep in mind in relation to energy efficiency and your point of sale could have a future effect on the value of buildings. And that's enough from me.